Hello, I'm Ruth Newby and this is Anatomy and Physiology for undergraduate allied health students. This presentation will focus on the innervation of the upper limb and the brachial plexus. It will discuss the areas of the upper limb innervated by the brachial plexus, the structures of the various nerve groups and the individual nerves involved. As humans, our ability to manipulate our environment comes from our large brain and our useful upper limbs, which have complex musculature combined with extensive innovation. You will need to use your text to carefully revise and refer to the anatomy of the bones and muscles of the upper limb, as I'll only provide a brief review here. I won't be discussing the pathophysiology of the innervation of the upper limb as such either, but because I want to put this into context for you, I'll mention some of the occasions when this knowledge is relevant to your clinic. You'll recall that there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves which are named and numbered by region and level of spinal cord, and that they pass through the intervertebral foramen between vertebrae. As you know, a plexus is a group of nerves, networks of various numbers of individual axons from adjacent nerves emerge and then recombine. So nerves within a single plexus may often contain axons from several different spinal nerves. The ventral rami of each of the spinal nerves C5 to T1 form the brachial plexus and provide motor and sensory innervation of the upper limb. They each leave the intervertebral foramen of the vertebra and pass through the posterior triangle of the neck where they extend over the first rib and into the axilla. I'm pleased to report that this is one of the most complex nerve supplies in the human body. The brachial plexus is responsible for cutaneous sensation and muscular innervation of the upper limb and injury to the brachial plexus affects its sensation, uh, the sensation and movement in the upper limb. In humans, in comparison to the lower limb, the human upper limb trades off stability for flexibility. The glenohumeral joint has a very shallow acetabulum and the brachial plexus passes between the bony structures of the shoulder girdle, the humerus, the scapula and the clavicle. So it's worth noting that the brachial plexus is located in an area of the upper body which is frequently involved in traumatic damage such as pulling or stretching or crush injuries where the nerves are damaged by the bony structures themselves. So let's examine these structures. To begin with, the brachial plexus arises at three different levels of the spinal cord, C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1, and it forms into three trunks. The superior trunk of these three is formed from C5 and C6. C7 forms the middle trunk and C8 and T1 merge into the lower or inferior trunk, as you can see on the diagram. Each of these trunks then divides into an anterior and a posterior division, so six divisions in all, which then regroup to form three cords. The posterior cord from the three posterior divisions of the trunks, the lateral cord arising from the anterior divisions of the upper and middle trunk, and a medial cord, which is a continuation of the anterior division of the lower trunk arising from C8 and T1. Five branches arise from these, but there are also a number of preterminal branches which come away from the brachial plexus at several points, as we will discuss later. Uh, we should note here that the brachial plexus also provides autonomic innovation, innovation to the upper limb through intercommunication with the stellate ganglion of the sympathetic trunk at the level of T1. So this uh, involves vasoconstriction to regulate skin pallor and temperature, contraction of erector pili muscles and the production of sweat from sweat glands. And this is where I get to tell you that the literature shows that up to 50% of individuals have some form of anatomical variation 
from this typical pattern. I won't go into a great deal of detail here, but the three most significant variations are firstly a prefixed brachial plexus in which the contributing nerve roots are all moved upwards one space and so arise from C4 to C8. Secondly, a postfixed brachial plexus in which the nerve roots are moved down, arising then from C6 to T2. Uh, and in addition, there may be individual nerves which are completely absent um, or, they, or that intercommunicate with others or arise from alternative chords. Uh, slide 7 provides a table of the distribution of the individual nerves of the brachial plexus and we'll cover them now. I have expanded them on the next two slides. As we do this, it will be helpful for you to refer to your anatomy and physiology text to the diagrams of the musculature of the upper limb. At the same time, it's important that you consider this information in the context of the clinical presentation and think about the sorts of sensory and motor impairments that might result when individual nerves and nerve groups are damaged. The dorsal scapular nerve arrives, arises from C5 and serves as the motor nerve to the levator scapulae and to the rhomboid muscles. The long thoracic nerve crosses the first rib and then descends through the axilla behind the major branch, branches of the plexus. It innervates the serratus anterior muscle. The suprascapular nerve arises from the upper trunk and innervates the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. It then runs laterally beneath the trapezius and enters the supraspinatus fossa. It passes beneath the supraspinatus and curves around the lateral border of the spine of the scapula. The musculocutaneous nerve is a mixed nerve containing both sensory and motor axons and it's derived from the lateral cord. It innervates the muscles in the flexor compartment of the arm and carries sensation from the lateral or radial side of the forearm. The lateral pectoral nerve passes across the axillary artery and vein. It's distributed uh, to the deep surface of the pectoralis major. The medial pectoral nerve divides into a number of branches which supply the pectoralis minor muscle. In fact, the medial and lateral pectoral nerves often join together to act as a single nerve innervating the pectoralis major and minor muscles. The subscapular nerve then arises from C5 and C6. It supplies the subscapularis and teres major muscles. The thoracodorsal nerve arises from C6, 7 and 8 and supplies the latissimus dorsi muscle. The axillary nerve from the posterior cord leaves the brachial plexus at the lower border of the subscapularis muscle and continues along the surface of the axillary artery as the radial nerve. The axillary nerve serves as motor innervation to the deltoid and teres minor, which act at the glenohumeral joint. Sensory innervation is from the skin just below the point of the shoulder. The axillary nerve then continues as the superior lateral brachial cutaneous nerve of the arm. The median nerve arising from C5 and T1 provides motor innervation to most flexor muscles in the forearm and to the intrinsic muscles of the thumb. Sensory innervation is to the lateral radial three and a half digits, so to the thumb, the index and middle fingers and half of the ring finger. The radial nerve from the posterior cord continues along the posterior and inferior surface of the axillary artery and it innervates the extensor muscles of the elbow, wrist and fingers. Sensory innervation is from the skin on the dorsum of the hand on the radial side. And finally, the ulnar nerve is derived from the medial cord. Motor innervation is mainly to intrinsic muscles of the hand and sensory innervation is to the medial ulnar, one and a half digits, the little finger and half of the ring finger. 
For those for, who, for whom English is not your first language, I've provided an image here of a hand with the fingers named in their colloquial fashion. You'll, fashion. you'll notice that the smallest finger or the little finger may also be called the pinky finger. Uh, in clinically assessing causes of anesthesia or paresthesia, so paresthesia is an abnormal sensation, typically a tingling or prickling, or assessing muscular weakness in the upper arm, knowledge of nerve branches can lead to identification of the affected nerve branch or root and the level at which it's affected. And so it can enable us to clarify the cause of the pathology. The images on slide 11 are examples of some of the most clinically significant motor deficits. Injuries to the brachial plexus may result from stretching in clinical practice, typically resulting from sports injuries and motorcycle accidents, diseases and wounds to the posterior triangle of the, necks, the neck or axilla. They can cause complete paralysis, anesthesia and paresthesia, severe pain, muscular weakness and loss of function. A common cause of injury to the brachial plexus is a motorcycle injury in which the shoulder is pushed down and the head is pulled up, stretching and tearing the nerves. Injuries from contact sports are common as are penetrating wounds to the neck and shoulder. In newborn infants, obstetric brachial plexus injuries occur during birth when the infant um, head is delivered but the shoulders become stuck, requiring manipulation of the infant's shoulders to achieve delivery. The clinical research literature shows that larger and heavier newborns are more susceptible to this type of injury. Imaging of the brachial plexus itself can be achieved by MRI scans, particularly in the uh, coronal and sagittal planes, but that discussion is something for your clinical tutors, I think. Clinical testing for sensation and the patient's ability to perform movements, then comparing it to their normal side is a method to assess and then to monitor the degree of functional compromise. Most importantly, imaging of damage to surrounding bony structures is necessary to clarify whether fractures or bony pathology might be the cause of any nerve damage. This concludes our discussion of the innovation of the upper limb and the brachial plexus, and I thank you for your attention.